Good morning to everyone. My name is Yolo Casio Marcano. I'm deputy director of the procurement division for the community development block grant disaster recovery and mitigation programs. In this brief meeting, we are going to explain the process for the CDB, CDBG DR MIT IFB 2022-02. Invitation for bids for lead hazard assessment and abatement administration services. I would like to introduce the Puerto Rico Department of Housing Person. Along with me is Karen Canela Birrien, Technical Specialist, and Camille Garcia, Procurement Specialist from the Procurement Division. Also is Fernando Toledo, Deputy Director for Energy, Energy and Disaster Recovery. Also, Angel Perez from our Grant Manager, and Maria Rodriguez Medina from the Federal Compliance and Subrecipient Management Division. Any questions submitted in this meeting will be answered in writing and will be published in an addendum. Any information provided in this meeting does not change the terms and conditions established in the invitation for bids. All procurement processes shall be conducted in accordance with the terms and conditions established in the procurement manual for the CDBGDR program to guarantee full and open competition and fair treatment for all persons and entities involved in each procurement process. The procurement manual is available at our website and is incorporated by reference and made an integral part of this IFB. As I said, nothing said in this previous meeting will change any of the terms of the IFB except those made by a written amendment to the solicitation issued through an addendum. Now I'm gonna leave you with Fernando, who's gonna to explain the scope of services for this uh, IFB. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is Fernando from Puerto Rico Department of Housing. And first of all, I would like to read the scope of services uh, through the agenda. And this issue for, uh, this invitation for bid six to select qualified firms that will be responsible for assessing uh, lead hazard as part of the participating property environmental review if the property was built uh, prior to 1978 and for uh, administering and overseeing a task order for lead abatement works if the property is found to have lead hazards. The Puerto Rico Department of Housing has anticipated awarding the resultant contracts for an initial three-year term with the option of up to two optional renewals of one year subject to the availability of funds. Now I would like to have an introduction about the uh, SURIMIT uh, program. So this uh, SURIMIT, SURI comes from the Community Energy and Water Resilience Installation Program. MIT, it comes from the word mitigation. So in this program, we're looking for uh, resilience uh, through the installation of photovoltaic system and or battery storage system, which will provide electricity during the time of a electric grid failure. The three principal fundamental of the programs are resilient improvement that would assist to household with a need and desire for alternative renewable energy installation and to mitigate the effects of the energy lifeline failure or disruption. Also, we're looking for renewable energy uh, to goal set by the Puerto Rico energy uh, public policy. And also we're focusing on critical mitigation funds on the resilience of the community and individual household. In the next slide, uh, we have the SURIMIT. Uh, under SURIMIT, we have three different sub programs. The first one is the Suri Harry. This particular one is uh, it's gonna provide funds for the installation of the photovoltaic system with battery storage system for low moderate income household that own a single structure and is their primary residence. This assistant uh, is gonna provide 100% or 30,000, whichever is less. Also, we have the Suri IP the incentive program. This uh, program, we have the installation of, at the same of the previous one, a photovoltaic system with battery storage. But in this particular one, it's gonna impact non-low moderate income household. 
that own a single structure as their primary residence. The system on this particular program we have will be 40% of the system cost or 20,000, whichever is less. Also, we have the SURI CI is that community installation program that's gonna provide funding for community installation of energy production and storage, water capture system and solution for sanitary sewer system, including the non-process community. Then we had a fight uh, for all three pro sub programs. We have a budget of 500 million. For the first two, the Suri Harry and the Suri IP, we have 450 million assigned to those two sub programs. And for the community installation, we have 50 million. Here we can have uh, the difference between the, the Suri Harry and the Suri IP. As I explained in the previous slide, the uh, a maximum award for the low moderate income household under Suri Harry is gonna be covering the 100% of the system cut, cost and the max award cap will be 30,000. Also under Suri IP, uh, it's gonna be impacting uh, the non low moderate income household that's gonna cover up to 40% of the system cost and the maximum award cap will be 20,000. We're estimating in the top right corner, you can see the estimate uh, 15,000 system will be installed through this Suri HH program. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, for the household, in order to be eligible uh, to, to the household, uh, it has to be a single family structure. That's a requirement. It has to be also, their Primary residence, it has to be USA citizen, non-citizen national, or qualified alien. It has to demonstrate ownership or be the proprietary interest. Also, it has to qualify under the low to moderate income levels following the Suri Harry program. And if the resident uh, is in the floodplain, it has to demonstrate that uh, it have uh, insurance covered. If the applicant, uh, for the applicant with previous federal assistance. Uh, in order to the system be eligible, it have to be a photovoltaic system plus with a battery storage system, or you can we can add a battery storage system to existing uh, photovoltaic system. Uh, in this case, sometimes we have a participant that it has just the photovoltaic system installed and it doesn't have the battery. So in that case, the program pro will provide fund uh, in order to include the battery storage system. The installation cannot begin, uh, cannot begin until an award for the system is executed between the applicant and the Puerto Rico Department of Housing. Uh, for the requirements of the photovoltaic system, uh, the minimum capacity will be three kilowatts the maximum capacity will be based on the annual energy consumption. And it's a requirement that all the photovoltaic panels, it, it needs to be installed on the roof. For the battery storage system requirements, uh, the minimum capacity will be nine kilowatts an hour and the maximum is gonna be 20 kilowatts an hour. Also the battery, uh, it needs to be lithium ion chemistry. And also uh, we're looking for a system with permanent affixion. So the system must be permanently, uh, uh, permanently affixed to the structure. So we are now allowing in this program uh, portable systems. Uh, also the design must be performed by a licensed engineer. Uh, the design must be consistent with the 16 site condition also. Uh, the, key, the equipment must be new we're not allowing used ones. And also you have to be DOLI certified under the regulation 7796. Uh, installation have to be, uh, it needs to be installed through a program approved rake that is a renewable energy installation company. And also it have to be installed by a certified installer. Also, the system must be commissioning following the requirements of the IEC 62446. And also all the system, uh, it needs to be submit an interconnection request to power uh, to the power utility. Uh, for warranties, the 10 years minimum is for photovoltaic panels. 
is we have a 25 years minimum for the photovoltaic module, modules. And also we have the 10 years minimum requirement for battery banks and inverters. Now I'm going to have a uh, Angel from Horn. It's part of the grant manager uh, for Vivienda, BRDOH, and he's going to be explaining about the uh, lead-based paint on all the process. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so now I'm going to get into the fun stuff of why we are actually here today, right? So um, we're going to talk about lead. Uh, more specifically, lead-based paint. So this program is going to be funded with CDG MIT funds, and really those funds come through HUD, so they are subject to the provisions containing 24 CFR Part 35, um, which is basically HUD's regulations um, for lead-based paint poisoning prevention in certain residential structures. So according to these regulations, based on the expected award caps for this specific Seurimit program, um, we are required to perform at minimum a lead hazards assessment, which is basically a lead-based paint inspection or risk assessment at each participating property where construction predates January 1st, 1978. So that is a regulatory requirement that the program needs to comply with. So, and if any lead hazards are identified, right? Lead hazards is not necessarily the fact that there's a lead in the paint. If it's not disturbed, then that's not necessarily considered a hazard. I mean, the risk assessors will determine what are hazards and what are not. If there are any hazards identified, then they need to be abated by the program. Um, Real quick, how the program is going to work. How is going? This is basically a representation of the program workflow. Um, we are going to start with the applications in. Take right. We're going to take some applications in, and every application that we take in, we need to do a duplication of benefits analysis, a system eligibility review, and a work calculation, a household eligibility review, and an environmental review. And that environmental review uh, can have Two more things that we may need to do. We need to do a property appraisal to check substantial improvement indexes for properties in floodplains. And as I just said, for those properties predating 1978, we also need to do a lead hazards assessment. Um, after all that is done, we are going to go into a reservation of funds process, which is basically PRDOH and the applicant executing a grant agreement for the system. And if, the, if there were lead hazards identified that need to be abated or any control or, or abatement activity regarding lead that needs to be implemented as part of that award, then Vivienda will take care of it by assigning a qualified contractors to the application and then going out, performing the abatement works, getting clearance, and thereafter the applicant can perform the installation of the system with his selected rig. Vivienda afterwards uh, performs the system validation and finally the administrative closeout of the application. So why are we here today? We are here today to talk about the two tasks that I just explained that are in the yellow golden color, right? Those are the tasks that are part of this IFB. Um, in terms of timing, the program is expecting to complete all of its eligibility reviews and award uh, determinations within 90 days of applications being received. Lead control and abatement activities are expected to be completed within 60 days from a task order being issued to the abatement contractor. The applicants will have 12 months overall to install their, their, their system with the rigs. And after system is installed and Vivienda finds out about it, the system validation is expected to take between 30 and 45 days. Um, so obviously, that workflow, not every single activity is performed by this IFB to say, right? Um, so this is a functional chart of how the SEURI program is expected to work. Obviously we have the Department of Housing at the very top, he's the grantee. Um, we have uh, grand, the grant manager, which is Horn, that's the company that I am part of. And we basically give support in every single thing to the Department of Housing that they need us to give them support on. And then we have the SEURI uh, program specific stakeholders, right? We're gonna have a reference cost estimator. That's a vendor that will basically tell us what's the reasonable cost for these types of systems. 
We, all, we obviously have the applicants. Those are the most important stakeholders of all. Uh, we have a SEURI program manager, which will take care of uh, intake, eligibility, uh, environmental review, system validation, and administrative close help. Uh, below applicants, we have the renewable energy installation companies. Those are the companies that install these types of systems all throughout Puerto Rico. Obviously, they need to be pre-approved by the program. There's a process that will be taken care of to do that. And right at the very at the very right, we have the you guys, um, the Seguri HH led hazards and administration contractors. And below you guys, we would have basically what we say call here an abatement contractor. Um, the idea behind your scope of work is for you guys to basically perform the lead hazard assessments and if there is any abatement work that need to happen, to oversight and inspect that lead assessment, that lead abatement work. But that lead, the actual abatement work will be performed by a third party. Um, regarding the specific requirements of your scope of work, so let's start with staff. Um, Two key staff really, two key positions are required in the scope of work. Um, one is the risk assessor or LBP inspector. This is the, it must be a person that is certified as a risk assessor or lead based inspector by EPA or the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, and basically this is the guy that will be responsible for conducting the lead hazards assessments and basically writing up a report on it and preparing any hazard control reduction mitigation or abatement plans to be implemented at the property as part of that report. Uh, and then we have the hazard control specialist and inspector. Um, so this is the guy that would come into play after um, the lead hazard assessment is completed and we need to do some abatement activities. This is the guy that will control the process, right? The abatement process. He, we must also be a certified risk assessor or lead-based inspector by EBA or DINER, and he will be responsible for the assignment of work orders to abatement contractors, follow-up and oversight of the abatement works, completion, inspection of the abatement works, and recommending the payment and closing of the abatement works task order. Um, and finally, we also have, he will also be responsible for keeping the applicant notified of the abatement works progress. Um, regarding the specific tasks that are part of this IFB, so there are two main tasks, right? Um, task number one is the lead hazard assessment. It's going to be performed by the program for each and every single property that was built prior to 1978. And it has the purpose of being an on-site investigation to determine the existing nature, severity, and location of lead-based paint hazards. Um, it will be accompanied at the end, right, by a report to discuss the findings. And if you guys want to know what the report needs to contain, then please follow 40 CFR 745.227D for the report guidelines. Um, the hazard assessment must be performed by a risk assessor or lead based pain inspector that must be certified by EPA or DINA. Um, as part of this task, you guys will be responsible for scheduling and coordination with the applicant for the date and time that you will visit the property, conducting the inspection and identifying the existing nature, severity, and location of the hazards, including soil and dust hazards, as well as paint. Uh, you can test the paint with X-ray fluorescent XRF analyzers. You can also collect paint chip samples. Um, I mean, it's really on the assessors uh, best judgment, what method he is going to use to do his job. Um, if you collect samples, then you must send them to the corresponding laboratory for analysis. And at the end of the day, you need to analyze all of that that you have gathered and write the report up, right, and submit it. Um, Lead hazard assessments must be completed at maximum in 30 calendar days from the day that it was assigned. Otherwise, you will be subject to liquidated damages. I think the other uh, persons, the other speakers here will talk more about that later. Um, and regarding the second task, the second task is lead abatement task order administration. It is for properties that will require some sort of control or abatement activities for lead. Um, and really it will consist of you issuing an abatement task order for the property to a construction manager. 
So our qualified abatement contractors will be the same construction managers um, for the R3 program and single family mid program. There's an RFP open for that. Um, and the CM will abate and submit evidence of the completion. And you will review that evidence. And if you find it sufficient to demonstrate that the work was completed, then you will schedule an inspection of the property, perform an inspection. Uh, if everything was great, then great. Recommend payment to the construction manager and make sure that we have all the documentation that we need to close out the case uh, in terms of lead, right? Lead abatement. As part of this task, a specific activities that you will be performing. So you need to assign a construction manager to the application and issue a task order. Uh, you also need to notify the applicant of who is the construction manager that was assigned. I mean, he needs to know who's going to be calling him and visiting him at his property. And you should also periodically follow up with the construction manager on the status of the abatement task order. For you to know, the construction manager will be responsible for coordinating with the rake and the applicant the day that they will abate, uh, performing the abatement plan, uh, acquiring the lead abatement permit from dinner, all that stuff, it will be performed by the construction manager. You guys are an oversight and inspection, and you guys are there just to ensure that everything is done correctly and that is well documented as well. Um, in terms of property site inspections, you guys will need to coordinate and schedule with the applicant uh, when you guys will visit to make sure that the construction manager did what he told you he's do he was doing. Um, you will need to inspect the property and the areas inspected by the CM, and you will also need to prepare an inspection report with your findings and recommendations. Um, and if the inspection you consider it as a pass, um, then you would be recommending payment of the task order to the contractor and also you will be sending a notification to the applicant letting them know that abatement works have been completed on the property and system installation can um, resume okay um, then the scope of work also includes some support activities they are not necessarily tied to any of the specific tasks um, but they are activities that nonetheless you need to perform in order to complete both tasks um, support activities are basically applicant relations and communication. So you need to provide um, support to applicants. I mean, if they ask you any questions about the process, whatever, you need to give them some guidance. Um, you need to maintain communications with them. And if they ask for status, provide them with status updates of the process. Um, record inquiries um, from the applicants. You will have a grant management system to record those inquiries. Um, provide written correspondence. We already talked about two notifications, the assignment of the contractor and the completion notice. Um, you should respond to applicants within one business days and uh, you must document all interactions with the applicants. And the other act support activity would be document control and management. And this is really basic stuff, basic stuff with any governmental contract. You need to ensure that all project information and documentation is really available, store, archive, retrieve physical documents and electronic images, provide sufficient and appropriate document control management, and work in coordination with PR device to maintain records and communications for detection of prevention of fraud, waste, abuse, or federal funds. Um, in terms of estimated quantities, um, Overall for the program, uh, Fernando mentioned at the beginning that he we expect to impact 15,000 homes. Well, uh, based on those 15,000 homes and the current ratio of years built for properties in the R3 program, as well as those that have required abatement, um, the RFP estimates that we would probably see around 7,700 lead hazards assessments that being task one. Um, that's, I think, around 50% of our trees population. That's where that number comes out mostly, kind of. And 2,800 in terms requiring some sort of abatement. Um, obviously, abatement here for those that have worked in the archery program, we don't expect abatement here to be the same uh, scale as in the archery program to say, because if you are demolishing a home, you need to abate everything, right? Even if it's not necessarily a hazard. But obviously here is more punctual work on more area specifics, so it shouldn't be that level of abatement. Um, and with that, um, I don't know if 
the procurement area wants to open to questions now or if that's something that happens later, but this is the slide that I have. I'm finished. Thank you. For the liquidated damages, the purity OH, the purity OH and the bidder will agree an itinerary to ensure the accuracy, timeliness, and completion of all tasks assigned under the contract. For this IFB, the purity OH has established a liquidated damages, the amount of $100 for each calendar day that any task deliverable required is late until deemed in compliance subject to a maximum of $1,000. Bidder shall be aware that in case of resulting selected for the award of this IFB, bidder must have a minimum required insurance policies and coverages. For details regarding insurance requirements, please refer to attachment four, which is titled insurance requirements. The IFB documents are available for download at the CDBDDR website, which is the one that is displayed as follows. Some of the important dates for this IFB are the following. Submissions of questions and requests for clarifications, November 18, 2022 at 4 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. Responses to questions and requests for clarifications, November 24, 2022. Bid due date, December 15, 2022 at 12 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. Request invitation to virtual public bid opening via email on or before December 15, 2022. And the last one would be virtual public bid opening, which is on December 15 at 2.30 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. Thank you, Karen. Now we're gonna talk about the bid submission. Um, bids must be submitted within the closing date and time for the IFB as established in the section 4.3 of the IFB instructions. Bids submitted after the established closing date will not be deemed accepted. Bidders must submit their bids in a closed envelope with their name, contact information, and the IFB number in the center of the envelope. The envelope must include uh, at requ all required documents as established in Exhibit A bid checklist. The envelope must contain the following completed original printed documents, the Exhibit A, that is the checklist, Exhibit B, a statement of the bidder, and Exhibit G, the cost form. Also, an electronic document, bid, and a redacted copy must be submitted as uh, in an electronic uh, media PDF format in a universal serial bus a USB flash drive. It is also suggested that information that the bidder must consider as confidential private or privilege, and that they do not want to be disclosure to third parties, must be um, in a redacted copy. Bids must be submitted on December 15, 2022 at 12 p.m. AST. If the bidder is interested in submitting the bid before the scheduled due date, they must notify the PRDOH with at least two calendar days to the following email, procurement at vivienda.pr.gov to coordinate date and time for submission. Bidders must be examined by the PRDOH security personnel before entering the Department of Housing uh, facilities located at the Juan C. Cordero Davila building. Mass usage is suggested. Regarding the opening date, due to COVID-19, a maximum capacity of 20 people has been established to attend the bid opening in person. Only one representative per entity may attend. If you are interested in personally attending the bid, 
opening, you must reserve your space by sending an email to our cdbgdr procurement at vivienda.pr.gov on or before the scheduled date in section 4.3. The use of mask, as said before, is suggested. If signs of illness are shown, the attendants will not be able to access the building. Please maintain a distance of at least six feet. All other people during the bid opening process. The bids will be publicly opened and read aloud by PRDOH procurement division personnel via a virtual public bid opening. The information shall be recorded and an abstract will be prepared and will be available for public uh, inspection. No, comment, no comments or, or statement of award will be made at the bid opening. If you are interested in attending the virtual public bid opening, you may request your invitation via email on or before the scheduled date in section 4.3. Regarding the evaluation criteria, the IFB includes the following evaluation criterion: The mandatory requirements. Mandatory requirements will be evaluated as either pass or failed. Failure to comply with each of the mandatory requirements of the, of the IFB will be result in the, in the bid being re rejected by the PRDOH. The financial requirements that will be evaluated as established in six say as uh, in section 6.1.5 of the IFB instructions. All required fin financial information must be submitted for the bid to be considered. The information submitted will allow to obtain a score of pass or fail after the evaluation of PRDOH. All documents authorized by a notary public outside of Puerto Rico jurisdiction shall be authenticated and include an official certificate or apostille from the Secretary of State, County Clerk, or corresponding entity of the statement government. Regarding the bid cost requirements, the cost for the services required herein will be submitted by the bidders using the Exhibit G cost form. Now we're gonna talk about the bid evaluation. Following the receipts of the bid, the PRDOH procurement division will evaluate each bid based on the mandatory requirements in section six of the IFB instructions. Following the receipt of the bid, of the bids, the PRDOH procurement division will evaluate each bid based on the mandatory requirements. The evaluation will be established as responsible bidders who are able to comply with the required goods and services being requested herein. The PRDOH procurement division will also evaluate the specifications of the goods and services submitted by bidders with the bids to ensure that they comply with the specifications of the scope of, or of services. This evaluation at the PRDOH procurement division discretion may also be performed by the user area within the PRDOH that requested this procurement process, those bids submitted by responsible bidders and whose goods and services comply with the specifications of the scope of services will be considered responsible bids. Regarding the selection and award, if the bid is to be awarded, it will be awarded to the responsible bidder that submitted the responsive bid with the lowest cost. Award will be made at, the, at fair and reasonable prices only. The PRDOH procurement division will recommend the award to the PR, PRDOH bid board. The award of the bid will be issued by the PRDOH bid board. The respondent and first year subcontractor must be registered in the system for award management or SAM at the time of the statement of qualifications or the IFB submission to initiate the registration right after the IFB submission. For more information about the system for award management, please visit SAM.gov. There is no registration fee to create or renew or update your organization's information on SAM. 
Awards will only be issued to entities that are cleared and not ineligible for award of a contract due to suspension, debarment, or HUD imposed limited denial of participation. Now we will have a presentation from Maria Rodriguez Medina for an introduction to Section 3 and MWBE business. Hi, good morning. I'm going to be presenting the federal compliance requirements for this procurement. My name is Maria Rodriguez from the Federal Compliance Division here at PRDOH. I will be showing you the presentation in one moment. You can see it, right? Yes. Hi, right, sorry. Okay, share sound. Okay, here it goes. But it's not in full screen. Hello, everyone. Ahora sí. Thank you for the space to present compliance and labor standards requirements. This presentation is prepared in English. However, should anyone need this presentation in Spanish, you can request using the protocols for this RFP. I am representing the Department of Housing Federal Compliance Team, led by Maria del Carmen Figueroa. Today we will discuss as part of our agenda an overview of compliance roles and responsibilities. We will also cover some tools that are available online. We will also talk about documenting efforts, taking advantage of training that's made available, and reporting requirements as well as frequently asked questions. In this presentation, we will be discussing Section 3 training, hiring, and contracting opportunities, minority and women-owned business participation, and fair housing and equal opportunity. Contractors or subrecipients using CDBGDR or CDBG MIC funding have certain roles and responsibilities. These include assigning staff who will attend the day-to-day -day implementation of federal compliance requirements, attending trainings and workshops, using tools and templates, executing the activities and completing documentation that's required. You can also participate in Department of Housing sponsored technical assistance sessions. You must complete quarterly reporting and comply with the reporting requirements. The procurement package contains sections that speak to the applicability and the requirements for MWBE. Within those sections, you will find helpful links to online resources that are made available, such as the policy guide. Procurement packages also contain language for Section 3 under 24 CFR 75. Although for this particular procurement, the contractor awarded will not need to comply with Section 3. However, you may find the information useful if you are seeking to prove Section 3 status to earn potential bonus points. Let's talk about Section 3. Section 3 is a federal requirement from the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968. This requirement states that we should provide to the greatest extent feasible job training, employment, contracting, and other economic opportunities generated by this HUD financial assistance to be directed to low, and very low income persons and businesses. The Department of Housing makes available a Section 3 policy guide on their website, both in English and in Spanish. Contractors must read and implement activities as applicable and necessary. They also are responsible for their subcontractors assuring that benchmarks are met. For Section 3 projects, 24 CFR 75 has established the following benchmarks. 25% of the total labor hours for a project should be work hours of Section 3 workers. And from that 25%, 5% of the total labor hours should be work hours of targeted Section 3 workers. Let's talk about the definition of a Section 3 business. A Section 3 business refers to a business concern meaning at least one of the following criteria, which is documented within the last six months. 
the business is at least 51% owned and controlled by low or very low income persons. It could also be a business that has at least 51% ownership and controlled by a public housing resident or residents who currently live in Section 8 assisted housing. It could also be a business that has over 75% of the labor hours performed for that business over the prior three month period by Section 3 workers. In this slide, we're going to look at the definition of a Section 3 worker. A Section 3 worker can be any worker who fits or when hired within the last five years fit at least one of the following categories. The worker's income for the previous or annualized calendar year is below the income limit established by HUD. It could also be a worker who is employed by a Section 3 business concern. Or the worker is a youth build participant. Now let's talk about what a targeted Section 3 worker is. A Section 3 targeted worker for community development financial assistance projects is a person who is employed by a Section 3 business. It could also be a person who currently fits or when hired fit at least one of the following categories as documented within the past five years. Someone living within the service area or the neighborhood of the project as defined in 24 CFR 75.5 or a youth build participant. The neighborhood or service area for a targeted Section 3 worker is that in which you can find at least 5,000 persons within a one mile radius of the project. If there are less than 5,000 persons within that one mile radius, you can expand that radius until you have 5,000 persons around the Section 3 covered project site. Each year, HUD releases new income limits. These income limits typically come out around April. The latest income limits for 2022 are made available on the slide. The Department of Housing has created various forms for helping maintain compliance. There is a Section 3 plan that can be used by contractors or subrecipients. There are also Section 3 self-certification forms. And finally, there is a form to help you document your efforts. Let's take a closer look at your Section 3 plan. This document helps you identify new hiring needs, subcontracting needs. It helps you plan your outreach efforts and assists your coordinators in identifying the day-to-day -day activities. It helps you define compliant procedures and it helps you understand your reporting requirements. You can use the link on the slide to visit the website and download a Section 3 plan template. In this slide, we want to focus on the Section 3 self-certification forms. These useful tools help you uncover if workers or subcontracting businesses meet the income thresholds required. HUD offers also a business registry. This registry allows you to register yourself as a Section 3 business. The registry also has a tool that helps serve folks looking for Section 3 business databases. We will now turn our attention to minority and women-owned business compliance. There are various regulations that call for the inclusion of minorities and women business enterprises. 2 CFR 200.321, as well as Executive Orders 11625, 12138, and 12432, establish the participation of MWBE firms, which seek to ensure that when possible, contracts and other economic opportunities funded in whole or in part with federal housing and community development assistance are directed to minority business enterprises and women business enterprises. The Department of Housing has established an MWBE policy guide 
This is available on the website in both English and Spanish. You can access those documents using the link on the slide. Let's look at what a minority business enterprise is. An MBE is defined as a business which is at least 51% owned, operated, and controlled on a daily basis by one or more American citizens of the following ethnic minority and or gender and or military veteran classifications. African American, Asian American, Hispanic American, Native American, Hasidic Jew, persons with disabilities and other individuals who can prove social and economic disadvantage. Women Business Enterprises, or WBEs, are businesses that are at least 51% owned and controlled by one or more women. The owners must be U.S. citizens or legal resident aliens whose business formation and principal place of business are here in the U.S. or its territories and whose management and daily operation is controlled by women. The MWBE policy guide will identify that there are goals which apply to professional services, purchasing supplies, and construction contracting. There is a total of 20% minimum participation goal. This 20% is comprised of 10% for women-owned businesses and 10% for minority-owned businesses. Contractors are expected to perform good faith efforts for contracting, subcontracting, and purchasing opportunities of $10,000 or more during the life of the contract. The Department of Housing has also created various forms for helping maintain compliance with MWBE. One of those is the MWBE Utilization Plan. This document template allows contractors or subrecipients to identify how they plan on being in compliance with these contracting goals. There is also a waiver form. This document allows contractors or subrecipients to identify if they meet the requirements to waive their goals for MWBE. Let's look at the MWBE Utilization Plan. This tool helps you compile data for your subcontracting. It helps you identify what needs you may have. It helps hold discussions on creating supplier and contractor listings, and it provides awareness of meeting the goal for the contract and tracking. You can use the link on the slide to go to the website and download the plan template. Let's review how you should complete your MWBE utilization plan. The Department of Housing Utilization Plan template can be used throughout the life cycle of your contract. Completing the plan is pretty easy. You should read the general instructions in row three and complete sections A, B, and F from the document. Complete the information requested in the yellow cells. When we talk about certified minority or women-owned businesses, we are referring to those who have filed applications with federal entities such as SBA and others that you see here on the slide. Businesses who are certified can provide proof of completing an application process to be officially recognized as a certified minority or women-owned business. If you are registered as an MWBE, you should provide your valid certificate or other evidence in response to this RFP. In this section, we will be discussing how to complete your efforts and quarterly reporting. In order for you to report your efforts, the Department of Housing provides a tool. This tool helps you document and identify how often you are seeking interactions with Section 3 businesses and MWBE businesses. The quarterly reporting form allows for you to share and report your data with the Department of Housing. This allows the agency to fulfill oversight responsibilities and monitor the progress throughout the year. The Department of Housing's quarterly reporting form allows for the user to capture multiple compliance areas all in one Excel form. Section 3 data is collected. MWBE data is collected as well. FHEO information is also documented within the report. And finally, 
For those who have construction projects, there is a report for Davis-Bacon Unfound Workers Efforts Reporting. Awarded contractors will be responsible for reporting four times a year, on April 5th, July 5th, October 5th, and January 5th. This ensures that you are meeting benchmarks and documenting your efforts. The quarterly reporting template is also available on the Department of Housing website. Let's briefly discuss FHEO. Your RFP package will also contain a model contract which outlines fair housing and equal opportunity areas of compliance. Contractors are responsible for ensuring compliance with federal civil rights and fair housing through their contractors, subcontractors, and so forth, ensuring that all necessary efforts are being made. The Fair Housing Act and Sections 109 and 504 prohibit discrimination against the following protected classes of people, race, color, national origin, religion, sex, age, familial status, disability, gender identity, and sexual orientation. The Fair Housing Act is part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There are many executive orders, laws, and statutes that govern the non-discrimination of protected classes to ensure equal opportunity for individuals in accessing federally funded programs. Equal opportunity is afforded to protected classes through a number of these federal laws and executive orders. The Department of Housing has published policy documents attending FHEO as well as language access plan. These policies must be implemented by contractors and subrecipients. They are publicly available online in both English and Spanish. You are encouraged to click on the links and access the resources available. As a recipient of HUD financial assistance, the Department of Housing must ensure that all programs affirmatively further access to fair housing and that the programs provide equal opportunity for participation and employment. Reasonable accommodations are changes made to policies, practices, services, and structures or modifications to afford equal opportunity to individuals with disabilities. The costs associated with providing reasonable accommodations and modifications are to be incurred by programs receiving federal funding. HUD contemplates these additional costs as necessary to ensure that the programs and activities it funds do not discriminate against people with disabilities. The slide contains a link for you to access the reasonable accommodation page on the Department of Housing website. Limited English proficiency refers to a person's limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English. Due to Puerto Rico's high Spanish-speaking population, all entities and contractors using the CDBGDR funding must seek to ensure that both a person's limited ability to read, write, speak, or understand English or Spanish will not place them at a disadvantage in the participation of programs. Let's briefly discuss some common, frequently asked questions. Can a business be both Section 3 and MWBE? The answer is yes. A business or a contractor can be both because these compliance areas are actually separate. Section 3 identifies the level of incomes to determine the status. MWBE uses race and gender information to qualify a business. If I am not planning on subcontracting, do I still need to complete documents? The answer is yes. You should still submit your MWBE utilization plan, the documentation of efforts template, and your quarterly reports. If Section 3 doesn't apply to my contract, do I still have to complete the quarterly report? The answer is yes. You will have to complete the MWBE portion of the report and the portion of the report that attends to FHEO. If I'm either an MBE or WBE, do I fulfill the total goals? You may have safe harbor for one of the goals for MWBE participation of 10%, but you will still have an additional 10% goal to show good faith efforts for any subcontracting or purchasing you perform with the CDBGDR and CDBG MIT funding. What happens if I don't fulfill the goals before the end of my contract? All awarded contractors should perform and document their efforts. 
Department of Housing has developed templates discussed in this presentation that help you complete the exercise. You can submit a waiver before the end of your contract for approval. This waiver request should be submitted with the efforts and justification as appropriate. Thank you for attending today's training. We hope you found the material helpful. Please remember to direct all your questions through the established protocols for this procurement. Procurement team, I'm handing over the presentation to you now. Thank you for your attention. Have a great day. Thank you, Maria. Well, I think that's all the information we have for you today. Remember to keep noted the due dates. Um, we want to thank you, everyone from City Beach, from PRDOH, that been giving uh, all this information. And that will be all for today. Thank you very much.